adventure I was about to have. I was 24 years old, unmarried, and I had a nursing diploma from the hospital in Winnipeg. My name is Alice. When war broke out in 1914, my father, the Reverend Hugh Campbell, orated from his Anglican pulpit of the need for young men to enlist in the army to fight the godless Huns. There was propaganda everywhere to join up, to farm, to ration, to nurse, and I was eager to do my part. I was a woman of the 20th century, eager for excitement and adventure. And so, for the splendid sum of $4.10 per day, I entered the Canadian Army Medical Corps with the rank of Lieutenant and was shipped off to England. My first hint of the new world that I was entering was on board ship when I saw that we were accompanied across the ocean by armed vessels. On arrival in England, 20 of us nursing sisters, we were called sisters because most of the early nurses belonged to religious orders, were sent to a stationary hospital there. But it soon became clear that we were needed closer to the front at casualty clearing stations. I was sent to the number one Canadian general hospital in France. We were set up in brown canvas tents which held 70 beds and two operation rooms. The soldiers there, we named as bluebirds because of our blue dresses, our white aprons and white veils. Our uniforms were very prestigious, but the high collars were very uncomfortable. However, it was army regulation that they be worn at all times, so wear them we did. The aprons were heavily starched. The theory being that the lice that came off of the men would not stick to them. This proved better in theory than in practice. As it turns out, I was not prepared for conditions at the front. So close to the war being conducted on the southern and eastern fields of the battle in France. Our compound was under constant threat of German raids, even though these actions were against the Hague Convention, and many nurses died while attempting to do their healing work. The hospital compound that I was working in was bombed on May 19, 1918, and three nurses, my friends, were killed. along with 56 fatalities and many wounded. I was injured by a falling beam, but managed to keep on working, helping to evacuate the wounded and other sisters trapped in the debris. On May 29, 1918, the number three hospital in the Citadel of Doulans, France was bombed. Even though the hospital was well marked with red crosses, which were quite visible from the air, for the night was clear and bright. Three Canadian nurses died in this raid. Our hospital training in Canada did not prepare us for conditions at the front. In addition to treating battle wounds, we also had to treat infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, dysentery, typhoid, with whatever disinfectants we could find. And in the closing months of the war, we also had to treat the flu ep epidemic, the Spanish flu that swept the world. In April 1915, we began to receive casualties from the German use of poisonous gas, and it was impossible to supply the demand for respirators. Ambulance after ambulance and convoy after convoy brought in the wounded, and this went on all night. 
bugle would sound and staff would immediately begin to help patients. Those who were able were bathed by the orderlies, given a clean, warm bed, cocoa, bread and butter. And of course, they all wanted cigarettes. Men and officers were wild about smoking. These men, they were so grateful and they wanted so little. Many had been gassed and burned by liquid fire shells. Some were desperately injured, especially about the eyes. The new gas mask recently provided proved inadequate. The gas penetrated and burned the masks. Wounds caused by bursting shrapnel they were the most severe. Ripped and, and torn, penetrated tissue in a horrible manner. I had never seen such awful wounds. The Germans used glass, screws, needlepoint, anything they could find to make a bad wound. There were sometimes 30 to 40 funerals a day in our compound alone. For some men, their nerve had gone and they cried like babies. Others just stared and said nothing at all. They all seem so young. I have had badly wounded boys of 17, 18, 19. One 17 year old boy had one leg amputated and the other leg and one arm peppered with shrapnel. The soldiers raved in their delirium, many delusional, thinking they saw their wives, children, mothers. Some deaths were calm and happy, others just the reverse. A bullet in the lung of one young soldier could not be extracted, and every breath that he tried to take was in agony every moment of time that he was not under the influence of morphia was an agony and he died a bad death struggling hard for each breath one had been shot in the stomach and asked me to send for his mother for he said i cannot hold out much longer one had told me that he had died and did his mother know Men who came in convoys were in a terrible state of nervous collapse, a great many of them having been blown right out of their trenches. We suffered heavy bombardment at night and it was impossible to sleep through the noise. From my window, I could see gun flashes, ground lights, and searchlights. One night, there was a heavy bombardment all around us with 17 inch shells falling close during operation. My knees did shake. The air would be thick with red dust, flying bits and smoke. Three zeppelins passed quite close overhead. Our wards were full of gas poisoning cases, a terrible sight. The slight ones looked rather like pneumonia. The bad cases, they were terrible. They were blue and gasping, their lungs full of fluid and not able to cough it up. It was not unusual for six or so men to die in our ward in one day. We have one wing of a lunatic asylum with room to accommodate about 500 patients. The director of this unit one day made us nurses a great offer. We may use the lunatic's bath twice a week for one hour. Now, this may not seem like a very exciting thing to most people, but to us, it was heaven to be able to lay in an entire tub of water. At that point, I had not sat in water deeper than one inch since coming to France. As the war dragged on, our workload became very heavy. There were times when we were too close to 300 operations in 10 days. 
Some days we had as many as 600 badly wounded men through our hospital in one day. There were days when we would go on duty at 9.30 a.m. and stay till 9 p.m. with no time for meals. There would be amputations of arms and legs and insides cut and packed in. Some days we just lost track of the cases that we treated. In one six day period, we had over 2,000 wounded to attend to. Some of them were so blown to bits, they came in just to die. Others go straight to the theater for amputation of limbs or to have their insides, which had been blown to bits, replaced and made a little bit more comfortable for the few hours that they had left to them. Our wards were full of groans and pleadings, and sometimes we didn't know where to start for the hundreds of things that needed to be done at once. We were all tired in, in mind and as well as in body. We heard that Ypres was ruined and that heaps of dead French, English, and Belgium lay all over town. The road between our line and Ypres was strewn with dead horses and smashed carts. We did get a chance to go off duty occasionally. We could spend time only with other officers because of our ranks as lieutenants, but because of, or perhaps in spite of, the grim reality of our working conditions, we attached great importance to our social life at the front. Dances were held whenever possible, and we did play tennis and other sports. Sometimes an orchestra would visit and entertain us with a musical evening. A great favorite of mine was walking into the countryside, away from the front, for a picnic. Once, on just such a day in the country, with my friend Edith, an aeroplane flew close over by our heads and the observer waved to us and we waved back. Oh, how I longed to be taken for a ride on one of those marvelous machines. There was some tension between us Canadian nurses and our British counterparts due to the fact that we had higher salaries, more distinct uniforms, and <laughs> we were popular with the officers. Also because of our rank, we had much more freedom because we were so far from home. We had the liberty to travel and, and do things that no respectable girl would be allowed to do back home in the upper middle class families from which most of us came. We also became friends with some of the soldiers who had long hospital stays. Hearing about their families and getting to know them. However, it was always hard to see them suffer. In June of 1918, I was on the Canadian hospital ship, the Landovery Castle. We were returning to England after having brought Canadian casualties back to Halifax. This assignment was considered a welcome break from the heavy nursing in France. And even though we were aware of the constant threat of German U-boats, we felt relaxed and refreshed and would be able to continue our duties once again at the front. On the night of June 17th, the night was clear and all lights were burning with a large red cross signal prominently displayed Edmund Ship. Without warning, there was a terrific explosion. <laughs> Immediately, all the lights went out. We had been torpedoed by a German U-boat. The ship began immediately to list and sink, but all of the nursing sisters were quickly lowered into a lifeboat. We were lowered to the surface of the water, but there was difficulty getting free of the ropes that held our boat to the side of the ship. The choppy sea was pounding our boat into the side of the ship. The crew tried to keep ourselves away by using the oars and soon every one of them was broken. Finally, the boat became loose and we started to drift away when suddenly a part of the afterdeck seemed to break away and sink. I was very afraid, but I tried not to show it. 
And to this end, my discipline and training went out. I heard nursing sister Frazier asked Sergeant Knight, who had charge of our lifeboat number five, if there was any hope for us. He replied, no. We were drawn into the whirlpool of the submerged after deck. The suction quickly drew us into the vacuum. The boat tipped over sideways and every occupant went under. My mother in Winnipeg received all of the medals that were due to me. The 1914 to 1915 star, the British War Medal, the Victory Medal, and the Royal Red Cross Medal. This medal was given for exceptional service, services in military nursing, and on the reverse is imprinted faith, hope, and charity. These tokens from an appreciative nation did give some consolation to my family for my loss. Our, Our wards would be full and then and emptied, emptied and, and, and filled again, again at once. once. There were men lying on stretchers or in the garden and the grass and, and other, other places. places. Cases, Cases inside, inside were, were very bad. bad. And many, many soldiers, soldiers died. died. They just kept, kept dying, dying all night. night. We, would we would evacuate at 2 a.m. and fill up again. And at times, I would have close to 200 men in a ward built for 60. When we did have spare time, we often wrote letters for the men who were incapacitated. Many times, I wrote down the dying statements of men, transmitting them to their relatives through the Red Cross organization. 